Thank you. Good morning. Thank you all for your patience. Uh, f for those who check this service out online, uh, you should know that t we still have a lot of snow, and the roads are, the main roads are plowed, sort of, and, uh, but a lot of the streets are very difficult. We have a wonderful congregation of 15 people, including me, who, hardy souls, who came to worship God uh, despite everything, and we just heard a wonderful trio by our choir, uh, the three choir members who are here, a beautiful piece. The reason that doesn't get posted online, we don't post any of the music online because anything that's copyrighted, uh, we would violate law if we posted it online, so, you know, you're stuck with pretty much just the sermon. Uh, the New Testament reading, which I'm about to read from Math, maybe I'll do the reading first and then do the time with children. Getting out of order seems like an orderly thing to do. Matthew 5, beginning at verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. So I came up with a fairly obvious thing for time with children. I, I have here a wonderful light, and it, uh, I can wear it. It's very useful if I'm trying to fix something which isn't very light. And I brought a basket, and Jesus is saying, Nobody does that. You lose the effect of the light. And he says, you and I are light. And we should let others see our light. And I just um, think of that in contrast to our very polite Presbyterian uh, caution about not wanting to offend anybody uh, and say, no, come on. It really is okay to talk about Jesus outside these walls. So I en encourage you with that. We're not... If I leave this on all through the service, my battery will be gone. Um, and I'll really regret that. The rest of the reading uh, begins at verse 17. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. I don't know if any of you watched a game on television last Sunday afternoon. Anybody? Yeah. And, you know, how would football be as a game if you were less rigid and strict about the rules? I mean, suppose, you know, you got up to fourth down and you had two yards to go and you tried for it and you almost made it, wouldn't it be okay to bend the rules a little and, and let you have a fifth down? I mean, what would be wrong with that? 
And then if that didn't quite make it, maybe a sixth down, you know. No, for, for the game to work, you have to have the rules. And uh, if you don't have the rules, you really, you don't have the game, right? Well, for the game of life, I think a similar thing is true, you know. And uh, Jesus uh, is saying here, yeah, the law is important. Uh, in, the, in the reading from the psalm in the first verse, happy are those who delight in God's commandments. And the Jewish people did delight uh, in, in God's commandments. Uh, and Jesus says, I have come not to abolish but to fulfill, to fulfill the law and the prophets. I think... Uh, an appropriate way to translate that is that Jesus came to accomplish the purpose of law and prophet. And that he's, he's saying, no, the rules, are, the rules are good, but there's a whole lot more to it than just sticking by the rules. That may be the point of that um, slightly terrifying last verse, I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus saw in his time the scribes, the teachers, and the Pharisees as people who were really focused on all the long list of rules. And that we are to be focused, not, not that we throw the rules, all the rules out, but that we are to be focused on something deeper than that. In fact, uh, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, righteousness uh, can be thought of in terms of uh, strictly keeping to all the rules. That's I suspect how most Americans would hear the word today, and if they say somebody is righteous, often there's a little undertone of self-righteous, uh, not an attractive person, not the kind of person I want to be. Uh, but the word righteousness uh, that Matthew wrote is a word that also means justice. And in the language Jesus spoke, uh, same word, justice and righteousness. But righteousness also can be thought of in terms of being right with God, being connected with God in the way that God wants us to be. Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets, to accomplish what the law and prophets were for, and what God revealed God's self to the Jewish people for was to establish a relationship with them. Sometimes they got to thinking the specific rules were more important than the relationship. Sometimes they wondered why uh, we have to be different from all the other people. Can't we be just like them? Um, I really think Presbyterians aren't very different from Jews in that respect. Um, we sometimes forget that what God wants is a relationship. to fulfill the law and prophets, to put us in relationship with God. And to be in relationship with God requires um, several things. I think it requires a willingness to listen, a willingness to get quiet and think, what is God? What is God saying to me? What is some next thing I need to do? And uh, requires honesty to have a healthy relationship. I think there's probably more than one person in here who's had a relationship that went down the tubes because there wasn't honesty on a deep level. I like the line from Steve Green, who's a Christian singer and songwriter. 
and uh, he he wrote a book, Listening Heart, and has this wonderful line: "I'm still a recovering hypocrite." Uh, there's that need for all of us to, again and again, uh, commit ourselves to being honest with God. Be honest with God when I'm angry at God. Be honest with God when I doubt God. Be honest with God um, when I'm delighted with God. To be honest with God when I think what God is asking of me is just way too much. Uh, to have a healthy relationship, you, you don't pretend with each other. And so uh, Jesus would encourage us not to pretend with God. So to be willing to listen, to be honest with God, I think uh, really to have a healthy relationship with God means I need to be willing to change. Not, well, it depends on what the change is, but often not something that's very easy for me. And we have to remember with all of this that for Jesus and the people he was talking to, they did not think individualistically. They thought in terms of community. And when he says, you are the light of the world, he's using a plural, you. You, plural. All of you that I'm talking with, you are the light of the world. All of you that I'm talking with, you are the salt of the earth. And all of you that I'm talking to, I came to fulfill the purpose of scripture for all of you. And we have a tendency as Americans to think of it individualistically and thinking I all by myself have to be the person Christ is calling me to be. But in fact, we need one another, you and I. We need one another to discern where is God calling us individually. We need to bounce our what we think we're hearing from God with some other sensible, mature Christians, and as a congregation, we need together to think through what God's calling us to. An unfortunate thing sometimes happens in a church when a pastor thinks that God has given the pastor alone a vision which that pastor then needs to lead a congregation without really the congregation being involved in and discussing with one another how they're hearing God's call. We need one another to be the salt of the earth. None of us can be alone. We need one another to be the light of the world. None of us can be that alone. Unfortunately, our hymn is uh, in the singular, Take My Life and let it be consecrated, but I would just pray to God, take our lives and let our lives be consecrated. Um, so let's join in praying that hymn.